Zion Williamson's knee injury. Let's get it! Hey everybody, Dr. Chris, orthopedic surgeon and sports medicine physician. Welcome to my channel where I talk about broken bones and other stuff. So, Zion Williamson hurt himself and he underwent surgery earlier this week. Although I'm not gonna talk a lot about this, here's a little background. We have a freakishly athletic large man who happens to have valgus alignment of the knees or not knee appearance who had previously injured himself last year and then recently injured himself again, same knee, the right knee, for which he underwent meniscal surgery or arthroscopic surgery of the knee earlier this week. So that's the extent of where we are right now. For more information, be sure to check out some of the other awesome videos on this topic, including two of the recent videos from Dr. Brian Sutter. He provides a lot of good information about the factors leading up to this injury and about the injury itself. Today, I'm gonna to talk about the injury from a more surgical perspective, and I'm going to talk about four things in particular. Number one, why did his surgeon choose to debride rather than repair the meniscus? Number two, what are additional options should this injury recur or should the knee become more painful in the future? Number three, what are Zion Williamson's prospects when it comes to his future in basketball? And finally, what can he do to decrease his chance for re-injury in the future? So let's get right to it. So question number one, why did Zion's surgeon choose to debride rather than repair the meniscus? In the press report, they stated that Zion had undergone a debridement of his meniscus. Debridement typically describes a process where we use our meniscal shaver to shave down or to clean up the surface of a roughened meniscus. From a surgical perspective, debridement and partial meniscectomy are not the same thing. Partial meniscectomy, on the other hand, is a process where we will typically remove or resect, meaning to cut away, a portion of the meniscus using a meniscal biter or a meniscal shaver. And on the spectrum of possible meniscal procedures, typically a partial meniscectomy is going to be more aggressive than is a debridement. Of course, there's also the meniscal repair which is where we will sew or suture the meniscus parts that are damaged back to one another so that the meniscus is retained. Generally speaking, there are several factors that guide our decision on what to do when we enter the knee for the first time and see the damage with our own eyes. And typically, those factors include the type of tear and the location of the tear. And although there may be other factors that influence our decision, these are the two most important factors when we're looking at a young, healthy athlete. In terms of meniscal tears, there are a lot of different types. And some of those meniscal tears are more amenable to repair than are others. The types of meniscal tears that are possible include radial, parrot beak, vertical, horizontal, bucket handle, and complex. Tears that are of a small size or of a simple nature are more likely to be repairable than are those that are larger and are more complex. Types of tears that are more easily repairable include partial thickness horizontal tears and simple tears. Tears that are more difficult to repair, on the other hand, include bucket handle tears and complex tears. These are two types of tears that are generally larger in size and that have more planes that travel through the body of the meniscus. Not only is the type of tear important in our decision-making process, but also the location of the tear is of paramount importance when we're deciding whether or not to repair a meniscus. When we look at the cross section of the meniscus, we can separate the meniscus body into three parts. And these three areas are differentiated by the blood flow that travels through them. These areas are typically described as the red red zone, the red white zone, and the white white zone. The red red zone, which is the closest to the outer periphery of the meniscus, is the part of the meniscus that is the most rich in blood supply. The white white zone on the inner periphery of the meniscus, or the part that's closest to the middle of the joint, 
is the part that has the least amount of blood flow. The red-white zone, obviously, is the part that's in between, which has an intermediate level of blood flow. We like it when we see tears that are in the red-red zone, because this tells us that these tears have a rich blood supply, and when we repair them, these are the tears that are gonna be most likely to heal. White, white tears, on the other hand, have a very low incidence of healing after repair because the blood supply here is basically non-existent. The red, white tears obviously are somewhere in the middle between the red, red tears and the white, white tears. They have an intermediate chance of healing after surgery because there is some blood supply, it's just not that great. So from a surgical perspective, if they chose to debride rather than repair, First, they use the term debridement and not meniscectomy, so it tells me that they probably didn't remove that much of the meniscus. Now, of course, they could have been using the term debridement and meniscectomy interchangeably, but when surgeons talk about arthroscopy, those typically mean different things. The fact that they chose to debride the tear in Zion's case gives me some probable information about the tear. The decision of whether to debride, resect, or repair a meniscus is not always a clear cut and simple decision. Just because it's large doesn't mean that we're going to cut it out. And just because it's small doesn't mean that we're going to repair it. For example, if a tear was large, but simple and had only a single line through it, this is the type of tear that we would repair with meniscal sutures or meniscal repair implants. On the other hand, if the tear was very small, but extremely complex and degenerative, then this is the type of tear that we would likely debride, or if it was slightly larger, perform a partial meniscectomy. So in Zion's case, I'm guessing that the tear was likely small, but also of a complex or degenerative nature, meaning that the involved tissue was likely in very poor condition. Because the condition of the tissue was quite poor, there was not an opportunity to perform a repair. And because the involved area was likely quite small, there was no need to do a larger resection. As we know, this tear was located somewhere in the lateral meniscus. It's kind of difficult to guess where in the meniscus it was, but I would say most likely it was probably on the inside edge in the white, white zone. So let's move on to the next question. Number two, so what are the options? Should this problem recur or should his knee become painful in the future? The options include number one, additional arthroscopy. Number two, an unloader brace. Number three, a corrective osteotomy. And number four, meniscal transplant. Now, this is the second time that Zion has injured his knee in a one year period of time. And I believe this is the first time that he has actually undergone arthroscopy for his knee. At the age of 19, having had two knee injuries and his first arthroscopy, this does not necessarily bode well for his future. If we assume that the meniscal pathology that Zion presented with was relatively minor, then it is possible that after this debridement, he may go on to have no problems in the future. But as Brian mentioned in his video, he has a number of things that are working against him, including his size, his valgus alignment, and his previous meniscal injury. So it should come as no surprise that his chances of having a knee arthroscopy in the future are elevated beyond that of somebody who is in the normal population. Another option for future treatment, should his knee be painful, is an unloader brace. And this is a rigid brace that is used to correct someone's alignment should it not be neutral or should they have a compartment that is problematic away from which we want to shift their balance. Most people have a neutral alignment. And with a neutral alignment, approximately 60% of the weight goes through the medial compartment, the inner compartment of the knee, and 40% goes through the outside compartment of the knee. In Zion's case, because he has a valgus or knock knee alignment, this means that most of the weight goes through the lateral compartment. And unfortunately, this is the compartment where he has his meniscal tear. Because he is heavy, and because he has valgus alignment, this is going to predispose the lateral compartment to problems in the future. We may want to fit him with a rigid brace which actually shifts his weight bearing into the medial compartment, away from the lateral compartment where the meniscal tear is. An unloader brace is one way in which he can do this. 
And this is a way of shifting the weight in a non-operative manner. However, there is an operative technique that will allow us to do the same thing. And this is called an osteotomy. And an osteotomy just basically refers to a procedure where we cut the bone and we angle the bone in such a way to allow us to correct the weight bearing line of the patient. There are several types of osteotomies that can be performed, including osteotomies of the femur or the thigh bone and osteotomies of the tibia or the shin bone. In Zion's case, with the lateral meniscus tear and his valgus alignment, we would generally want to perform a varus producing osteotomy or an osteotomy that shifts his weight bearing line towards his medial compartment. Were I to be doing this surgery, I would perform a distal femoral osteotomy. In other words, I would be cutting the thigh bone just above the level of the knee and wedging it open on the outside in order to tilt his weight bearing line into the medial compartment. By wedging the distal femur and tilting the weight bearing line into the medial compartment, we move the bulk of the forces away from the lateral compartment and away from the torn meniscus. Now, although the osteotomy is somewhat invasive and it is an operative intervention, there is one more operative procedure that might be of value to him in the future. Should Zion go on to have ongoing pain in his lateral compartment after the debridement or potentially a partial meniscectomy, then he may require a meniscal transplant in the future. And this is basically a procedure where we take a meniscal graft from a donor that has been matched by MRI or CT scan to Zion and we implant that meniscus into his knee in the lateral compartment where his previous meniscus lived. Now I'm sure you're wondering, how would we attach something like that? Well, when we take the graft from the donor, we actually leave the meniscal attachments intact and we take the meniscus out with a piece of bone. Then we would implant that meniscus graft plus the bone attaching the front and the back portions of the meniscus into Zion on block. In other words, we're putting the whole thing in. We are attaching bone to bone, which is basically more stable than trying to attach a meniscus to the bone or than sewing meniscus to meniscus. So which of these options he goes with will be dependent on what his symptoms are in the future and when they arrive. In other words, does he have pain six months from now, or a year from now, or five years from now? And speaking of five years, question number three, what will happen with Zion in the future? Well, this is a little bit harder to predict, but there are a few things that we can say that have an increased chance of occurring as a result of the factors involved with this case. As previously mentioned, Zion weighs almost 300 pounds. He also has a valgus alignment. He has previously injured the right knee, including a sprain that he had in February of this year. He has now undergone a debridement of the lateral meniscus of his right knee. And there have been a number of studies that show that there is an increased incidence of osteoarthritis in the future after someone has undergone a partial meniscectomy or a debridement of the meniscus. So if I had to guess anything about Zion's future, I would say that this is probably not the end of problems for his right knee. I would say that there is probably a good likelihood that he will go on to have some kind of symptoms, some kind of pain in the future, maybe in a few years, maybe after five years, or maybe even as far as 10 years. But almost certainly there is likely to be some radiographic evidence of osteoarthritis of the knee within 10 years. So for now, we'll just have to watch and keep our fingers crossed. And finally, is there anything that Zion can do to decrease his chance for injury and problems in the future? Fortunately, there are a few things that he can do and these are relatively easy. Zion can stay fit. And what do I mean by that? Well, he can train to maximize his strength, his flexibility, and his mobility to make sure that he is less likely to become injured. And what do I mean by mobility? He can train to make sure that he demonstrates strength throughout the entire range of motion. And he can train balance and proprioception so that when his body experiences awkward positions during gameplay, it knows how to handle them. He could lose some weight. The lifespan of the cartilage in the joint is partially determined by the amount of force that is going through the joint at any one time. Obviously, the lighter a person is, 
the less amount of force is going through the joint. If you want to preserve the meniscus, then you want to decrease the weight. And in his case, because he weighs 285 pounds, well, anything lighter than that is gonna be better. Zion might want to consider wearing an unloader brace, like from now, instead of after when he starts to have knee pain. And in this particular case, he would be wearing the unloader brace as a prophylactic or preventative measure. By wearing this brace, he would help to decrease the amount of force in the lateral compartment by shifting it to the medial compartment and therefore give his knee a longer lifespan. So he might wanna consider that. So today we've been discussing Zion Williamson and his knee injury, and I've given you my surgical opinion on this injury, its treatment, and his prognosis in the future. Be sure to share, like, and subscribe. And as always, that's been a word from Dr. Chris, not your everyday, or to go. Just a flesh wound.